All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to our Ask Me Anything session. We wanted to take this opportunity when we're all in a virtual format to open up a really informal conversation with our CEO, Sharon Hirsch. Um, the intention originally was for folks who wanted to tune in live to ask anything, um, anything's on the table about our organization, about the work that we do and the history of our organization. Um, but I'm gonna be asking Sharon some of those questions and folks can tune in after the fact. So thank you, Sharon, for making the time on this rainy Sunday to, to answer a few questions. Always happy to be here and to talk about our work. Yes. So how, how are you doing today? How are you doing? I'm actually hanging in there. I've, um, you know, it's a Sunday right at noon and it's, it's a rainy day, but it's been a nice relaxing weekend. And how, how have things been for you and your family during COVID-19? I hope everything is well. It, it's actually, it's gone okay. We've had some extended family that have gotten the virus, but they have all thankfully recovered. And, um, you know, my husband works retail, so we are adjusting to, um, the fact that he sees people every day and I pretty much stay here in my house and it's been a, an, an interesting challenge, but my, my kids are doing fine and we get to see my son and his fiance every once in a while. So we, we can't complain about anything because we're, we're healthy and, and safe and doing okay. That's so great. And you are leading an organization, a statewide nonprofit during this pandemic and the recession and all that all that goes along with that and how's that going? Well, it's going better now than it probably was at the very, very beginning back in March. There was so much uncertainty then and we didn't think that we'd still be dealing with all of this in October, November and into 2021. So things have really changed pretty dramatically. We have um, had to adapt and adjust a lot of our work. Um, you know, we, we have teams of folks that work with agencies and practitioners across the state, and we've not been able to see any of those folks in person. We've had to adapt our, our coaching and technical assistance for the practitioners that are delivering parenting, education, and family strengthening programs to 100% virtual. And that's been a really big challenge. It's been a challenge because we've got folks that haven't ever used Zoom before, except possibly with a coaching call with us. And having to help them figure out how do you how do you engage with parents and and deliver a parenting education program that is very clearly prescribed. We're trying to foster model fidelity, and to do that in a virtual environment has meant we've had to adapt and adjust from the normal way of doing things. We also have, are fortunate that we have parenting programs in the far eastern and far western parts of the state, but they often don't have great technology and broadband access. And so that's been a, a really big challenge. And it's something that I don't think I ever imagined we'd be talking about as, as an equity issue and a real need for uh, prevention programs and prevention services, but internet access is really big. I'd say another piece of it is that um, the folks that are delivering these programs at the local level are having the same challenges that all of us are. We're all um, people who are both employed and we're really concerned about our families and um, not knowing how to engage families in this environment, particularly at the beginning of the recession, uh, the, the pandemic, we were very much focused on continuing programs that are that were already in place. Um, Incredible Years um, groups had already been established and the parents that were involved in those were already selected and had probably had a couple of sessions. Now that we've transitioned to the fall, we've had to figure out how do you recruit new families to be involved in a parenting program when we're not seeing them. We're not out in the community and able to recruit and our partners aren't out able to recruit. So that's been a really a, a big source of stress for the folks at the local level in trying to do this work. Um, yeah. And that's all yeah. aspect of the work. That's just our prevention programs team. Our, our um, partnership engagement and communications team had to take everything we did for Child Abuse Prevention Month and we weren't able to plant pinwheels. We weren't able to do public presentations. We weren't able to be really engaged like we normally are and had to take it all virtual. So that was a huge shift. And there's so much more that we're doing online and, and the engagement on um, social media in particular and really changing what we have on our website and how we're, we're engaging and trying to attract people there to get their attention. We created a, a 
a COVID parent and caregiver guide early in this process. And our partners at the Department of Health and Human Services asked me again last week to do another push to remind folks that that's available and to get that, particularly in the hands of educators who've now had to go back and adjust to doing what we're doing right now and having their classes online. And then how do they identify and, and support the, the parents of the children that they're trying to teach? So it's a lot, a lot of very different work and doing, doing an incredible amount of, of Zoom calls. I think uh, Zoom fatigue is a real thing for me and I think it's a real thing for our entire team. For sure, yeah. And for folks that may not be familiar um, with our work, Sharon touched on our three uh, primary focus areas. One is public awareness, raising awareness um, and educating folks about the importance of prevention, that child abuse and neglect is a preventable problem. And um, we wanna kind of change that conversation from not just focusing on intervention and treatment, but moving upstream to prevention. So that's a lot of our work that our team does. We also, um, a newer area of our work is advocating for family-friendly policies and having those same prevention conversations at the state and local level um, to advocate for policies that help families, things like paid family leave, uh, which is very relevant during COVID. <laughs> and then the third area of our work is what we call capacity building. We're kind of working with local communities, making sure they have the tools and resources and support that they need um, to do the same sort of work at the local level. Um, and that's where Sharon was talking about um, the programs, the parenting programs that we support across the state, making sure they're able to keep those support programs up and running for parents, because gosh, uh, parents need support more than ever during COVID. Yeah, one of the things that I think has been really, um, we've been really fortunate because we've been running the Connections Matter campaign for more than a year now. Actually, when I go back and look at my Facebook memories, we launched our uh, billboards last fall this week, which is really kind of amazing. Um, but that campaign is, is both a training and a social norms campaign to teach folks about the importance of, of being connected to one another. Uh, the science behind all of that says that relationships are the biggest builder of babies' brains and the greatest buffer of trauma in adults. And we're living through what, I mean, one of our colleagues has said what we're living through right now is low-grade persistent trauma because there's so much uncertainty around everything. So the, the message of that campaign is, is really, really important now. Um, we had been training folks across the state to be trainers, to deliver this in their communities. And that really has shifted. We've had to figure out, so how do we train trainers on Zoom? How do we help them make the experience relevant and engaging to folks when we can't do it in person, when we can't have that, that personal connection? Um, and I've been blown away by the number of, of people that have continued to, to want to be engaged in that, particularly at the, um, in the faith community. We just had a, an entire week of, of webinars talking about the five protective factors and the importance of staying connected with congregations. And it was an extraordinary thing to see more than a hundred different faith leaders across the state using our language and talking about the importance of building protective factors in community and what a special place congregations often are to do that. Um, we know that when those five protective factors, which is what we've called this 5K is all about, the five factors, 5K is the five protective factors. And uh, we, we were able to talk a lot about how um, the adults in, in children's lives are the most important because when you think about those five protective factors and we always use our, our hand signals for those that only one of them is about children. Um, the first Wait, one is, with your thumbs up sign is um, about children's social and emotional competence. Children having the, the ability to talk to other adults and to their peers and having good, good boundaries and, and good relationships is a a strong sign of, that children will are less likely to be abused. Um, your middle, your pointer finger is about knowledge. And that one represents knowledge of child development and parenting skills. Um, you know, that's why childcare is so important and early childhood education and being um, able to have your children in a safe nurturing environment where 
the educators know the stages of development and, and what we can expect a two-year-old to be able to do versus a five-year-old. They're, they're very different stages and expectations are important in that. Um, your third protective factor is your middle finger, and that's the one that I never let stand up by itself because <laughs> it requires social connection. And social connections are a, a real, I mean, it's obviously, we talk about that with Connections Matter a lot, but um, having a network of folks that you can call on when things get difficult, who you can just have, have a friend that you can, that will listen to you when you just need to vent is a really critical thing for parents, especially in the early years. The early years are really, really hard. Um, your ring finger represents parental resilience. Parents who can bounce back in a crisis, who don't just fall apart, but can learn and grow from it, um, and then teach that resilience to their children, are less likely to abuse their children. And then finally, our pinky finger represents concrete supports in times of need. And while it's that little finger, it's a, it's a mighty one. And we know that parents who can put food on the table, who can pay their rent, um, have access to um, affordable wages, um, or not affordable wages, but living wages, um, affordable housing, um, is, and affordable health care are all critical foundational pieces. And, and we know that um, if we want to really reduce child abuse and neglect, investments in our safety net are the most important thing that we can do. And, and there have been studies that show a $1 increase in our minimum wage reduces child maltreatment rates in a state. So this COVID time has really, I think, raised special awareness of all the things that we talk about that are important to support and strengthen families that many people don't think about as child abuse prevention activities, but how critically important they are. And I, I, I get hopeful that we're all gonna understand this better and make those investments in the future because as we know what happens in childhood impacts our health, our mental health, our, our earnings potential for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, the five protective factors are very foundational to all the work that we do. Um, and the, as you mentioned, the namesake for this race that we do every year is also to raise awareness of those five protective factors. Um, Sharon, I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about our policy work. Um, we are not only in, have a pandemic and a recession, but we also have a really major um, election coming up um, next week. Um, and, and, so and right now. now. <laughs> right now, early voting. Um, but there's just a lot going on and this is very relevant for people's lives right now, the policies of both at state, federal and local level that affect our lives. Um, will you talk a little bit about the work that PCAMC does in the policy space? Sure. You know, we're, we're really getting back into policy work for the first time in, in a couple of years. And our, our work, again, is really built around the protective factors framework. We, we talked about, so what are the, the policies that we could support that help to build support for parenting and knowledge of child development and concrete supports for families? And so um, as we did that, we've, we've talked about wanting to do it in partnership. So most of what we've been doing for the last year or so is to work in partnership with an alliance called the Think Babies North Carolina, North Carolina Alliance. And it's a group of organizations that are committed to increasing the access to policies and programs for children zero to three. We know the, that babies' uh, brains develop at a, an incredible rate, and the more we can invest early in those um, prenatally through um, age three, the, the stronger our, our positive outcomes are for the rest of our lives. And our work has particularly focused on um, supported families. What kinds of policies and programs need to be in place to support families. So our work is particularly focusing on um, increasing access to home visiting and parenting education. Um, in addition to the parenting education programs we support, North Carolina is really fortunate to have <clears throat> a number of models for home visiting. Um, Nurse Family Partnership, Healthy Families America, Parents as Teachers, and even um, some of the um, early Head Start program um, includes home visiting. Um, and there's a program called Family Connects that was um, developed in Durham at, at Duke, at the Center for Child and Family Policy, that is a universal home visiting program that is 
available to every family in a community gets a visit after the, the birth of a baby and gets connected to other resources, can have up to three visits. Um, our agenda this next year is going to focus on um, increasing access, particularly to Family Connects, because it's a universal program and that because it's universal, it also helps us to address um, the idea of targeted universalism in our, our policy agenda to really um, focus on equity. Um, so uh, we're excited about that. Currently, um, Family Connects, of course, was created in Durham and has been in place for about 10 years. Um, Forsyth County has it now. Cumberland County is expanding it. And the preschool development grant that the state just received will be expanding it in a pilot to nine more communities. Our hope over the next two years is to increase awareness about how effective that program has been and increase it and um, allow us to sustain the program beyond this initial preschool development grant. Um, and that's really exciting. Um, the outcomes that we've are actually have been proven through randomized control trials with Family Connects have been extraordinary. It's been a, a, a drop in child abuse and neglect rates. Uh, maternal depression has dropped. Um, um, and even uh, emergency room visits for young children have been reduced as a result of that program. So it's a it's a win-win for, for moms to get better connected to resources, for families, and for all of us and, and what we pay for in our taxes. Um, our agenda also includes um, paid family leave, as Claire mentioned. Um, paid family and medical leave is actually correlated to a, a reduction in child maltreatment as well. Um, moms and dads both that have access to paid family leave are able to foster that social connection um, with, their with their children early. We all know that the, the first weeks and months of life are really, really important. Um, we know in North Carolina that way too many moms are going back to work in less than six weeks. Um, we are really advocating 12 to 18 weeks of paid family leave to really foster that bonding. Um, it's, it, it's an economic support as well to have parents who, whose income doesn't diminish as a result of giving birth to a child and having all of those new expenses associated with babies between diapers alone, formula, um, all of the expenses, all of the things you have to buy for your children are, are an added stressor. Um, it's, it's again, it's, it's, it's good medicine, it's good policy, it's good economic support for families, but it really fosters the development of babies' brains. Those are the, the two biggest agenda items we have are, are paid family leave and expansion of, of home visiting and parenting ed. But we're also really interested in other economic supports and other ways that we can um, support and strengthen families. So we're keeping an eye on things like the earned income tax credit and how to get more families engaged in it, how to re possibly even reinstate an earned income tax credit for North Carolina. We used to have a state EITC and when the recession happened, that, that moved away, it was eliminated, but it's a, a really important piece to put about $400 more dollars in, the, in the hands of, of families that are working can really make a, a big difference for low-income families. That's great. Yes, we, um, those two examples, the home visiting, access to home visiting and parenting education, and then um, income supports and paid family leave are, some great examples of what in our world we call primary prevention, um, which there are actually different levels of prevention in the public health world. Um, and I, it's in our name, Prevent Child Abuse North Carolina, but I think um, a lot of folks when they see our name kind of envision, oh, how you prevent child abuse is, you know, what we think of as the foster care system or child protective services is, is kind of, when there is a problem, when there um, is sort of a dangerous situation, going in and working with families at that point um, is one way of preventing further mm -hmm. neglect, that's true. And we have a lot of wonderful partners that do that work. Mm -hmm. We certainly stay um, in close partnership with them. Our work though um, is, is further upstream, which is primary prevention, which is we want to prevent it from ever even getting to that point. Uh, we want to create the circumstances and the communities and the families that are supported and less stressed and have um, the resources um, 
to, to not kind of be in those volatile situations that might lead to abuse and neglect. Could, would you talk a little bit more about this focus on primary prevention sure. of our organization? Sure. Um, like you said, we're focusing on preventing it from happening in the first place. So our work is not going to be focused on um, increasing the number of child welfare staff. That would be something that we probably did about 20 years ago. Our focus would have been more on the child welfare system, increasing the availability of foster parents um, and access to therapeutic supports for children after abuse and neglect has happened in the happened. We want to really make sure that we, as you said, go upstream and create the safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments that we know children need to be successful so that that never even needs to happen in the first place. And that's why the em emphasis on home visiting and parenting education, one of the things we'd love to see is to normalize the idea of everyone taking a parenting class. Um, I, I always compare taking parenting classes to to taking a childbirth class because we almost all women in our country take a childbirth class, particularly when they have their first child. And it's, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a scary time, but we spend more time and more resources on preparing for the birth of the child than we do on taking care of the child after the child is born. Most labor and delivery last less than 24 hours. If we're lucky, less than 36 for the most part. Um, but we know that it takes until the age of 25 for our, fr our brains to fully develop. And so that's 25 years and 25 years of, of very different stages of child development, lots of challenges along the way. Teenage years are really hard too. Um, and we don't normalize the idea that everyone should take a child, a, a, a parenting class to help with the stages of development. And that's one of the reasons why I'm excited that we also provide some supports for the triple P positive parenting program. That's a universally available program. And particularly now during the, the pandemic, the Triple P program is also available online. The state has enough codes for parents to take that class um, to allow more people to have access to it. And even the online version of the class is really, really helpful. Absolutely. I'm curious um, if folks are wanting feel compelled to get involved uh this is close to their heart how how can just average people in north carolina and beyond support primary prevention um and support our mission at pca and the most important thing you can do is to be a connection um you know we're in a, a time when we're we're so isolated physically from one another reaching out to families that have young children and just to ask if you're okay, how's it going? Um, what can I do to help? Um, being connected in that way is just, it's, it's just critical for families to feel like they've got a, a support system. Um, right now we're in the middle of an election, as you just said, and I think the most important thing you can do is you consider who you wanna vote for from the top of the ticket down to county commissioner races, our state legislature, um, make sure that you're thinking about what, what is the position of these candidates on issues of support for children. Ask and, and read. Find out if they support things like paid family leave um, and economic supports for families. Those are really, really critical. And we often don't think as much and pay as much attention to the, the down ballot races as we do to what's happening at the national level. But you know, I think it was Tip O'Neill who said all politics are local. And um, who we have elected at city council and county commissioner level, as well as our state representatives, is probably more important in a lot of respects because the legislation and the, the policies and the programs that are available at the local level, particularly in North Carolina, are really driven by um, who we have in office at the local level. Our health and human services systems that support and strengthen families are primarily funded at the local level and with our federal dollars. So, paying attention to that is, is just really, really important. Um, and the other is to support agencies like ours financially. Um, oh, I will always ask you to support Prevent Child Abuse North Carolina, but when you are supporting your local food bank, your local um, shelters, your local um, agencies like Boys and Girls Clubs, those agencies are also a part of what we like to call our partners in prevention. 
because no agency by themselves and no family by themselves can um, exist on our own. It does take a village. So anytime that you're supporting the, the health and human services infrastructure in our state, you're also supporting the prevention of child abuse and neglect. Great. Um, my last question is, I think we've talked about enough of 2020 um, <laughs> and we're coming to the end of this year. And I'm curious from a PCANC standpoint, what are you looking forward to in 2021 in the next year as an agency? I'm really excited about the development of our policy work. I think that we have a real opportunity after this election to be educating a lot of folks about the way that we can invest in prevention policies. Uh, we've just been funded by the Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation to strengthen our policy work. And we're gonna be doing bellwether interviews with our state legislators. We're gonna be trying to understand what they know about adverse childhood experiences, trauma protective factors, and what works for prevention. And that will be a baseline for us to begin to educate more legislators about policies and programs that they can invest in. I'm really, really hopeful and excited about what that, that baseline of knowledge can help us do to advance supports for families. We're also really hopeful that we can um, figure out what the appropriate role is for Prevent Child Abuse North Carolina and preventing child sexual abuse. Um, child sexual abuse is much more prevalent than any of us want to think or believe. And there is not really a system in place to prevent sexual abuse in North Carolina. Um, we're very focused on the primary prevention of physical and emotional abuse, but the, 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 the um, systems and programs and policies are really not in place in North Carolina, really and across the country to prevent sexual abuse. So we'll be doing a, a landscape analysis, we hope, got our fingers and toes crossed that we'll have funding for that to really get a better sense of what our partners are doing across the state. There are some really wonderful programs like the Darkness to Light Stewards of Children educational program, but there aren't programs and we haven't had a focus on, on primary prevention of child sexual abuse. We had some great legislation, for example, that passed last year that was supported um, and advocated by the Attorney General's office to um, change the reporting process for sexual abuse and to extend the statute of limitations for victims to be able to sue or to um, have charges for sexual abuse. Because often what we've learned now about child sexual abuse is that our, our brains really protect us when things like that happened and often our memories are suppressed. And the average age of someone remembering what happened to them in, in such a traumatic way is actually in, the, in your mid 50s. So we were really excited to see that statute of limitations extended, but that's a very tertiary approach to child sexual abuse. So we really wanna look at what programs exist that support and strengthen um, parents in their support for children. How do we help children develop their, their social and emotional skills so that they understand boundaries and um, can advocate for themselves because we know children who both um, understand boundaries as a little, little one and know to tell their friends not to hit them, that also develop a sense of empathy and care for their children are less likely both to be abused or to become predators as adults. And if we can prevent predators from being developed, that's what I think is a real primary prevention of child sexual abuse. And we also don't have um, public policies that support educating children and adults particularly in our school system. And so there, there's a lot of opportunity there in terms of public awareness, policy change, and the ability to support programs across the state. So hopeful about that. And then I would say the last thing that I'm hopeful about is that we really will um, expand the availability of parenting education and home visiting programs. I think that we're in a, at a time when people are really starting to understand the importance of that and help us develop the ability to um, educate our, our public, uh, the, the general public and particularly practitioners across the state that work with families. Um, we really see an opportunity to provide more training and technical assistance outside of our traditional funding sources and really be able to seed communities in helping them understand all the things that we can do to, to prevent abuse and neglect because we know it happens in partnership and it happens in communities and families. 
um, prevention does not happen necessarily at the state level outside of policy change. So helping folks, I'm just very optimistic about how we have over the last two or three years really educated North Carolina about the importance of addressing adverse childhood experiences. We've had almost, almost 50 or 60,000 people across our state have seen the documentary film Resilience. And so there's this growing awareness coupled with a, a pandemic that has reminded us of how important our connections are to one another. So I, th I think that we're, we're gradually approaching a tipping point in understanding and I'm really hopeful that we'll see more investment in the next year. Great, so yes, hope, lots of hope in uh, 2021. Uh, we're all collectively learning throughout this struggle and um, yeah, we will continue our fabulous work at PCANC and thank you for your leadership with that, Sharon. Well, th thank you for the opportunity to talk about this and to spread the message that we can prevent child abuse and neglect. That we can. Well, thank you guys uh, for those of you watching. Um, thanks for joining us, for listening in and uh, for registering for our Five Factors Virtual 5K. I hope that you all have a wonderful race week. Look forward to seeing all your pictures. Yes.